you could describe me as someone who's an autodidact, um, but uh, exaggerated. <laughs> I, I, uh, I don't content myself with uh, learning the craft. I try to experiment with it. And I started very early as a draftsman and as a painter. Basically, when I was 22, 23, I was fed up with, uh, or I was at the end of a journey. And to work with time, with duration, became a real liberation for me. And since then, I've always said that I sculpt in time. I'm a sculptor and my matter is duration. Um, if it would be uh, intentional or if the idea would be to see and to be precise with what you witness and what you take back home, then yes, then it would be a pity that the duration of the work is a millennium and our lives is only, you know, I don't know, between 50 and 80 or 100 years. But more on a symbolic level, it means that our time and our attention span is very short, <laughs> while uh, there is a time out there or a duration out there, even if it's only fictional, which is very long and very large. And I think what I try is to give to duration or to time a certain shape, something that you can grasp. Um, however difficult it may seem, but you can grasp a millennium. Paradoxically, this is what Nazi Germany tried as well. It tried to grasp eternity. You know? Well, to, to work with motifs like the Olympic Stadium has been a recurring theme in my work. Um, I will start with something that is over-connotated, that is entirely embedded into, or would seem to be embedded into uh, history of something, in this case the history of Nazi Germany and of modern Europe. And then from there on, from this uh, specific knowledge, from there on try to take away the specificity of the location and to try to open it up to make it more panoramic. It can be problematic, you know, when you work with something that's so specifically political. But the Olympic Stadium is not that. Uh, when you look at the history of the Olympic Stadium and the Berlin Olympic Stadium, it was actually a project that was pre-Nazi Germany. In fact, one of the bronze um, signs, one of the f bronze portraits, this is something few people know, is one of the Jewish founders of the Berlin Olympic Stadium. It's still there and it was always there. I prefer that people don't understand it, go out, and then somehow the next morning, think again. <laughs> a common idea that we have of uh, moving images and film is that things happen right now. It's again this uh, dominance of animation, yeah, of uh, inorganic life in film. And if you do that, if you have this approach, you're always too late because the film is always ahead of you and the film director is always ahead of you. That means that the plot in, in the moving image will always be faster than yourself as a, as a viewer. So I kind of try to work with that which is not in the image, that which is outside. In Olympia too, if one would analyze what you're seeing, you're seeing nothing at all. It's not about the plants growing, it's not about the changing weather, it's not about the changing light, which are very pretty maybe, but they're very normal. You could see them outside too. It's about that which is outside of the screen, which is outside of the image.
you see, I think what's going on is that I mentioned this belief system or this confidence system, which is based upon the reality of the camera. And the people who are watching this believe that I am effectively sitting here speaking to you and to them. Um, and this is a very important vehicle for confidence in the image. Imagine that I was uh, a virtual reality or that I was uh, artificial in intelligence or a hologram. Um, they would be quite, some would be quite horrified and some would, would take pleasure in it. And I think that's uh, an important challenge lying ahead of us is that we are losing the belief system that came from our relation to the camera. By the way, doesn't it also reflect in politics and society of today is that the shrinking back to the national border within the minds of people everywhere in the world is somehow related to a protection reflex. Is that we want to know that what we see and what we experience is the real. Um, it is pretty certain that the lens, everything that's lens-based, that that is finite and that the camera will have a history of 200 years, but no more. There will be something that will resemble a camera. But I think what will happen is that we will return to a situation which is uh, a situation of the 19th century, before the invention of the camera. And that will go to we go back to a certain painting order in the image where we will live with, uh, in our everyday life, with the fabrication, the sense of fabrication in an image. And so we'll have to cope with it. We'll have to say goodbye to uh, the automated image, the image to which we have confidence, which is a belief system uh, of which lasted about 200 years and which coincided with modernity and that we'll have to embrace something else. But what it is, I don't know exactly. But it's interesting in the sense that it is our automated perception will disappear and we will have to think much more about what is the matter that we see in the image. We will have less confidence in it. We will speak much more. We will write much more about images. Perversion. <laughs> I'm inspired by uh, the relation between us and technology, ourselves and technology. The difference with maybe um, technological positivism is that I don't look at it as an opportune, as technology in terms of uh, an opportunity. I don't have a very positivistic approach to technology. Rather, I see technology as my enemy. Um, or as, in fact, I'm a collaborateur uh, in the old sense of the word. I work together, but I'm not really part of the ideology of technology. So I, I am friends and enemy at the same time.